I don't know, it was just a trip having those wild creatures come into my pool and have their little babies. I was sad to see them go. Well, it's time for me to start breaking down the therapy scenes from another work of media. Last time I went through every therapy scene in Good Will Hunting for a total of six videos. This time is The Sopranos for what could technically be an endless amount of videos. I am indeed a counsellor, originally trained psychodynamically, although I've been branching out ever since. It's important for me to stress before you begin that not only are there lots of different approaches to therapy, but that every counsellor or therapist also does things their own unique way way to an extent. There's likely things Dr. Melfi here in The Sopranos does that I wouldn't be comfortable doing myself or would do differently, and I may comment on that, but that does not mean it's incorrect or anything. There are just naturally lots of differences that have both advantages and disadvantages that we can tease out. We'll try and explore Tony as a person along the way, although that really will be along the way of this series. These videos will be much more analysing what we see specifically in the clips rather than linking it to the later seasons although feel free to do that in the comments. If you aren't familiar with The Sopranos, it's a sort of drama comedy from the late 90s and 2000s about a New Jersey mob boss, Tony Soprano, and his family. A show that manages quite well to mix all the tense drama you'd expect of a mob boss with raising a family, and because Tony begins the series suffering panic attacks that cause him to pass out, therapy scenes. We get three therapy scenes in the pilot episode of the show, and because this is my first video on the series, we're going to break down all three of those scenes in this one video. I expect that's going to make this very long, so I suggest we just get straight into it. So the entire show begins with this unexpected, iconic shot of Tony through the legs of the statue that we come to see is a naked woman. You know, following the opening credits of Tony driving back home, seeing very few clear shots of his face, he's kind of kept it a mystery as to who is this guy. It's quite an unexpected surprise then to be introduced to him first in a low down position in the pretty undramatic setting of a therapist's waiting room. The shot is, of course, symbolic. I'd actually like to hear people's thoughts on the symbolism here. Uh, I take it as both a Tony being quite intimidated by a powerful, open figure of a woman, figures Tony tends to struggle with in life, but I guess you can also see this shot like uh, giving birth, the beginning of therapy, something I think Dr. Melfi comes to describe therapy as. What's important is the statue unnerves Tony though, and to be honest I don't blame him. Not all private therapies have waiting rooms, obviously the good and bad of a waiting room I think is a discussion to save for a more fitting time, but if you do have a waiting room, you tend to like it to be as neutral and calming, inviting as possible. Coming to therapy for the first time can be incredibly daunting, especially as this is the late 90s. A nude statue is always going to be something that will put off some people, whether uh, unsettling them, angering them, a thing to sneer at. You know, not everybody's going to be keen on it, and for those people, that may make their beginning to therapy feel less welcoming, and so leave them more guarded. By the way, beginning the pilot to a new series with a long moment of silence instead of some great action to hook you in is such a bold decision that I love. The perplexing, intense kind of zoom showdown between Tony and the statue is broken by Melfi's appearance. Mr. Soprano? She's quite smiley and friendly looking, which is obviously good because they need to feel comfortable if they're really going to open up. There is that classic stigma of therapy like someone coming to siege your castle, invade your defences and attack you with criticisms. You don't want people to feel like that, not just because it's 100% not what therapy is about, but because the more relaxed they are, the more they express and... Uh, more importantly, the freer they are to reflect and to really think about their emotions. You know, personally I might have said a simple hi on top of confirming who he is, I might tell him my name, I suspect he would already know it, but it just adds to the friendly greeting, but it doesn't matter. Have a seat. There's a bit of hullabaloo about where to sit. <laughs> hullabaloo is a great word, I should use that more. Um, it's quite typical to set up chairs that feel equal and neutral rather than the therapist having the obvious therapist's chair and then the client having one that by extension feels lesser because 
I think it helps to be a bit more equal here. I think the danger of having a clear therapist chair is that it can make you more of an authority figure and authority figures being something the client may have difficulties with but I don't know I just think having a fancier chair than them kind of implies you're the smart one with all the answers like a doctor offering a cure and that's not how therapy works. The limits of the room sometimes mean therapists do have to have their own clear chair. It's hardly a disaster if they do. As well often there might be more than two chairs so they can pick which is the most comfortable for them in which positions. You know, do they want to sit nearest the door, furthest away, one of the chairs in between. I think what is particularly important however is that you and the client don't end up with two chairs that are too close together and are directly facing each other because that makes it incredibly intense. It's one of the things that bothers me about the therapy scenes in the show Ted Lasso as a slight tangent. She sits her clients right opposite her like this. It feels far too invasive and intense. Put a bit more distance between them and angle the chairs a little bit away from each other so that they're less head on. In my work I also tend to let the clients pick their seats. I'll normally just say sit anywhere you like when they first come in. But you do have to make sure whatever seat you end up in you can still easily see the clock from it because you do need to keep track of time and if you have to crane your neck right around to do that instead of a simple subtle glance it can make the client feel like you're not listening to them or like you're impatiently waiting for the session to end which is most definitely not the right impression to give them. And typically as we'll see in the show the seat they pick the first time is the seat they stick with because I guess you get quite territorial about that as your safe space, your home in the room. Tony sits back in a posture that I think conveys a feeling of being relaxed, um, makes him appear at ease, hides his nervousness, but at the same time that leg up is something slightly guarded. He's avoiding eye contact, looking around the room, and Melfi seems to wait for him to speak so he continues looking around and tapping his fingers. It does strike me as someone trying to hide their nervousness behind a veil of indifference and maybe impatience I suppose. Which is perfectly normal as it is to look around a new room you've just entered into, especially when this is a room you're going to open up your feelings within, you know, like put a pet rabbit into a new room in your home and it will carefully sniff out every corner, every crevice to make sure it's properly safe before it really relaxes. Silence is a very powerful tool I think every counsellor will employ at times because you need to give your client space to reflect a little further even if they don't always want that. I talked a lot about silence in my Good Will Hunting series however it is um striking to begin the first session with total silence. You know Tony's never had counselling before, he won't entirely know what it is, to an extent you need to lead them into it. First sessions are typically more introductory than later on, you might need to welcome them in a bit, say who you are, explain what counselling is, how it works, how they feel about it, ask if they've ever had any counselling before and what that was like for them, obviously um, explain confidentiality which he does do later on and the timings and things, ask whatever questions you need to get an idea of why the client is here and what they hope to get from therapy as well as maybe what their fears are about it and also give them space to ask the questions they need to ask you about the therapy. Not only is it useful to help them understand all of that but leading them in with a bit of an introduction is much more inviting and helps them feel much more comfortable. So in that sense I don't think I'd personally hit anyone that I counsel with silence from the first second of the first session. When Tony lets his gaze peek back to her she now does help him to begin. My understanding from Dr. Cusimano, your family physician, is that you collapsed, possibly a panic attack. You were unable to breathe. Which again is quite a sharp beginning, you know, straight in. From what I understand, you're here because you had a panic attack. Obviously, it's a good thing to discuss in the first session. What brought you here? What's the hopes? What's the aims? What's the fears about this? Tony's presenting issue is a panic attack and he's here to stop that happening again. Clearly, you need to talk about that. <laughs> but um, for someone who is quite guarded in his body language, perhaps a softer way into this conversation would suit better. Not that there is anything wrong with starting this way, I don't think it causes any problems. Tony just very naturally is quick to establish. They said it was a panic attack, of course all the uh, 
blood work and the neurological work came back negative. Nay sent me here. Which is Tony telling Dr. Melfi two things primarily. A, you're not labeling me with a panic attack. I don't agree. Panic attacks, of course, had a bigger stigma about them back then. But for a man whose very line of work needs him to appear strong, of course he doesn't want anyone attaching the phrase panic attack to him. His body language with the hand out there as well is very um, patronizing, maybe is the words. Uh, but B, it's saying, I don't want to be here, they sent me, I don't like the idea. And that can come up from time to time in sessions. For some clients, it is very important for them to make the point, I don't need you. Coming to therapy for help can naturally, even though it's not meant to, make you feel a bit kind of lower and in need of help, which is another reason for you and the client to have identical chairs actually. Um, but at a very basic level, asking for help in whatever situations can make you feel a little small. So sometimes clients do look to assert, I don't need to be here. Which is perhaps also part of Tony storming out later on, proving to her, I can leave whenever I want, I have power and agency in this. You don't agree that you had a panic attack? <sighs> I just wanted to mention this one because it's a nice touch. Sometimes in therapy, the clients just don't answer your questions. Although this technically is an answer, but you know what I mean. But sometimes they do just shrug or say, I don't know, or completely ignore the question altogether and just make you feel like an idiot, like you weren't heard. That does happen. It's the sort of thing you don't normally get in TV dialogue, so I think it's a nice touch. When this happens too much, it's normally a good indicator to change tacks a little, I guess, because you don't want to get stuck in a kind of strained dynamic of endlessly asking questions only to get one word answers where the more more you push, the more it becomes like pulling teeth. But in this instance, it again, I think is also a way for Tony to assert some of his agency in the sessions. I don't have to talk about whatever you ask me to. I can ignore the questions or stay silent if I want. So that's fine, you know, clients need to be able to express themselves. How are you feeling now? Good. Fine. Back at work. I think typical social politeness teaches us to always answer the question of how we are with a simple good, um, which does make the experience of therapy where you do the reverse a little bit strange. Look, I don't need to keep pushing this point, it's pretty clear that Tony does not want to be here, but more importantly he wants to press the point that he doesn't need therapy. He's not in need of anything, there's nothing wrong with me, I am strong. And it can be quite difficult to get into the work of someone in that mindset, because they are guarded, and this is why it can be good to take things slow from the beginning. Make the first session quite inviting and introductory, give them space to assert all they don't like about therapy, put out their defences. You know, I think pretty much 100% of the first session for Goodwill Hunting is just Will asserting his defences and Sean trying to let him and accept them. I guess as best you can help them understand there isn't anything wrong in going to therapy. It doesn't mean you need it necessarily. It doesn't make you helpless. The same way you don't have to need to lose weight to go to the gym. Sometimes people just go because it's a healthy, positive thing to do. Although that analogy doesn't quite work, but um, if Tony feels he wants to assert the point that he doesn't need to come here, then you let them do that. What line of work are you in? Waste management consultant. And she hits Tony with the silence again. Probably a better time for it here. It's good to give them space to elaborate beyond what is essentially a stock answer for Tony. Tony doesn't want to elaborate though, both for practical and personal reasons. Look, it's impossible for me to talk to a psychiatrist. Any thoughts at all on why you blacked out? I don't know. Stress, maybe. About what? A very good question to ask. Just to wonder with them why they feel whatever subject of conversation happened. And you want the clients to do the heavy thinking a lot of the time, not just because it's their feelings, so their instincts on what the situation was about are more likely to be accurate, but also because your job is partly to develop their ability to think and to reflect deeper. The stigma is you tell a counsellor your problems and they tell you what's wrong with you, give you an answer like a doctor when, even as far back as Freud, you know, his kind of revolutionary idea was to go, how about I don't know what's wrong with you? 
you just talk and we figure it out together. Not that you do think about the work in terms of something being wrong with you, <laughs> obviously that wouldn't be good, but um, the point is counselling is less about concretely fixing whatever issues there are in the client's life, so much as strengthening their ability to reflect and process their feelings so that they can start to do it all by themselves, so that eventually they don't need you, because the better they can process their feelings, the better control they have over them, the less they're blindly reacting to everything that happens in their lives, and so the more they can respond rather than just react, hopefully the better able they are to solve whatever issues they have in a healthier way. And that's part of it anyway, so you do try to help them think. Um, Tony's instinct here is that stress is the issue, that could just be him jumping to whatever seems the logical conclusion, or it could be truthful. Either way, Melfi probes further, as you often have to do. And we cut away to our sort of exposition bit for the episode. I think a lot of the therapy scenes in this first episode are built around what needs to be explained to the audience. It's masterfully done, by the way, but there is that that kind of affects the content. Tony says a few things here, but I think the main point Melfi draws out is that Lately I'm getting the feeling that I came in at the end. The best is over. To which she basically responds Did you have these feelings of loss more acutely in the hours before you collapsed? I don't know. I definitely would not have said that. Not because it isn't a good question to ask, but because there's no point asking questions if the client doesn't take them in. I don't know. <laughs> the strain in his face, like, what the hell are you talking about? I get the feeling he's also a little put off by the clinical nature of her language there. More than a question, it's an interpretation anyway, taking what Tony expressed about the best being over and feeding it back as a feeling of loss. A few minutes into the first session is quite a speedy time to begin offering interpretations, not just because Tony isn't yet that reflective and probably ready for this sort of stuff. Interpretations can be a bit uncomfortable and off-putting at times, you need him to first be getting engaged, and also because Melfi doesn't have a clue who this man is yet. What he's saying might not be about feelings of loss, or at least that might not be the crucial point of what he's saying. The way she words this makes it sound like it definitely is about loss, and you don't want to give the client that idea if it might not be true. It's better to raise it like a suggestion, a possibility, and then see what they think. That said, for all his response of I don't know, it is very poignant he then goes on to immediately tell a story about the ducks. A couple months before all this, these two wild ducks landed on my pool. And so in that sense, as far as it's depicted here, maybe Tony was ready for that interpretation and maybe Melfi was bang on the money. Much as I've said clients don't always respond to your questions, they also don't need to, nor should you expect them to respond. Often it's much more meaningful to pay close attention to their reaction and what follows on from that, because there might be a lot just in that. Maybe you make an interpretation and their response indicates you got it completely wrong, yes. Or maybe it prompts them to delve further. I mention loss, you mention the ducks in your pool. Is that a link? And this now is very much a vehicle for exposition in the show. We get to see his family, but I think the key therapy point we reach is that the ducks are trying to fly. It's great! Before we then go back to the stresses about his daughter. Now my wife feels his friend is a bad influence. You know, the original question was what causes Tony's stress, and I think this is part of his rational answer to that. My daughter and my wife are causing all this hassle. The darks, however, were more of his point getting sidetracked into something more emotional. But anyway, he's loosely going through his day and he gets up to talking about his career and he says, This isn't gonna work. I can't talk about my personal life. Finish telling me about the day you collapsed. You know, that's fine if you feel that way. I don't need to go to war with you over it. Just finish telling me about the day. Christopher, he's learning a business. Now he's an example of what I was talking about before. By which he means how in his father's day of the business there were standards, he had his people, loyalty, class. Whereas Tony gets a nephew who in his eyes is a bit lazy. Did you get up early this morning and call? He's always in his office by six. I was nauseous this morning. My mother told me I shouldn't even come in today. And there was this issue of an outstanding loan. Can I stop you for a second? I don't know where this story is going. But there are a few ethical ground rules we should quickly get out of the way. This is, of course, confidentiality, which, she's right, needs to be covered in that first session, especially if Tony is about to tell her something incriminating. They need to be aware of the rules before they tell you anything like that, otherwise, if you do go on to report it, it can make them feel like they were tricked. It's a betrayal, breaks down all communication, 
may possibly lead to the end of the work altogether. Confidentiality is basically anything the client does or says in the sessions won't be passed on. It will have that classic doctor-patient confidentiality, unless they reveal something incriminating, particularly if the client or someone else is in danger of real harm. And there is a level of grey area in this, but if it does seem likely, or even not impossible, that your client is going to put someone or they are themselves in real danger of harm, you definitely disclose it. So in that sense, when you suspect your client is a mob boss who assaulted a man over a loan repayment, quite obvious what you're supposed to do. But yeah, we know in this instance, if Melfi was to disclose this sort of thing, Tony being who he is would definitely not come back to therapy again, that would be the end of the work and that does make it a little bit tricky. Melfi is right to explain this before Tony reveals his story, however there is also something of a hint in her words, as if she's saying, I know what you do but don't technically tell me and I won't disclose anything. It's a massive moral dilemma, nine minutes into episode one, that does affect a large portion of the rest of the series. If I was to hear, let's say, a, a murder was to to take place. Not that I'm saying it would, but if. I don't know what happened with this fellow. I'm... I'm... Nothing. We had coffee. Tony says in a slightly patronising tone as though she's stupid to think anything more of this outstanding loan. And we cut to a comedic bit of Tony chasing this guy down in his car. Comedic in how it's filmed with the music because I think this is Tony's perspective. He laughs, clearly finding this fun, and I think it's crucial we see that as an audience in the first episode. A man who goes on to a level of emotion and sort of empathy in this pilot episode is also a man with quite a sadistic side. It then appears like two different sides to the man. Can one win out over the other or not? Can Tony change? We get some small discussion about his uncle, but I can't go into details on this one. That's fine. It's more important if we just jump ahead to the next, uh, lesser exposition based part of the therapy, which is the panic attack happening at AJ's birthday party. Whilst cooking, Tony sees the ducks finally fly off. At first it felt like ginger ale in my skull. He collapses. A little later on, following some bits of trouble about his uncle and some tensions between his wife and his daughter, Melfi hits him with a killer question. Didn't you admit to Dr. Cusimano that you were feeling depressed? It comes seemingly out of nowhere, to which we can only conclude Tony did hint that to Dr. Cusimano, who then informed Melfi. And just acting wise, the master that James Scandolfini was, I love his reaction to this question. He goes very still and tense, like he has just been dealt a very painful blow. With his head turned away, he slowly moves his eyes just enough to glare at her, like a warning, don't go there. And then we see her expressions, she's seemingly innocent, genuinely trying to ask him about depression rather than this meant as any form of attack. I think we can expect that word would feel like an attack to Tony, which is why I personally would have been a bit softer getting towards the question. Although if Tony did admit it to Dr. Kuzumano, then yeah, he should be fairly comfortable to talk about it here, even if he doesn't know Melfi very well yet. The other thing about Melfi's return stare though, apart from the seeming innocent of a question is that the stare is unwavering. She doesn't look away apologetically, she doesn't ask anything else, move things on in a sort of sorry that makes you uncomfortable, I'll drop it kind of way. Instead she holds her gaze and waits for an answer. Which is very good. I mean, sure I'd personally prefer to be a bit softer and gradual to get to that question, but you've also still got to trust your clients to be able to engage with the therapy. It's a good question to ask in an introductory session, it deserves a bit of silence to see what Tony says. If Tony moves things away because he isn't comfortable talking about it, that's fine, but you yourself don't move things away because that implies you don't think he is able to discuss it. Where I think the client needs your unspoken trust there, that these feelings are bearable, they're talkaboutable, thinkaboutable, I can trust you, hard as it is, to be able to do that. As much as counsellors do have to be very empathetic and kind of gentle in a lot of moments, they also need a kind of resilience and firmness. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes you do have to talk and ask about things that are like a rash and can make the clients a little on edge because thinking about our feelings isn't easy. Hopefully you can make it as comfortable as possible, but there's a great difference between a gentle manner and completely shying away from important feelings, you know? Sometimes it's good to be firm and unwavering and wait for a response, 
sometimes it's good to challenge your clients. And a stare does actually remind me of the statue, thinking about it. This unwavering stare Tony locked eyes with there, a woman that doesn't back down to him. And so, because Melfi sticks to her question and waits for a response, Tony appears to think for a second, but then looks across the room to find something of Melfi, something personal to her. Melfi. Now he looks instantly more relaxed, excited even, like a triumphant child when they feel they have the upper hand. What part of the boot you from, hun? I mean, he calls her hun. <laughs> I think that tells you everything you need to know about his feelings here. Her asking about depression felt painful, made him feel weak, because a tough man like him, as he sees it, the Gary Cooper type, isn't supposed to have depression. You've made me feel weak and attacked, how can I now do the same to you? Find something personal about her, talk to her like every other woman Tony tries to take power and control over, address her as Hun. Asking questions about the therapist's personal life is quite common. To an extent, that's a kind of, you've asked things about me, can I do the same in return? Testing that out, seeing what this dynamic of a patient therapist is really about. Partly it's to make the therapist seem a little less mysterious as well, the hope that the client will feel more comfortable talking to you if they know who you are as a human. In other cases, it can also be to get some power, I think. Um, therapists vary in opinions over how much or little they should reveal of themselves to a client. My feeling as I discussed in my Good Will Hunting series is that revealing some things about yourself can be beneficial but you don't want to reveal much unless you're sure it's for a good reason. You don't want to get carried away with any of it. Dr. Melfi. My father's people were from Caserta. Attacks of some sorts are always going to be expected from clients. You know, sometimes you do get clients who come in quite defensive and they tried their absolute hardest to make you feel weak and humiliated and worthless. That can be as much about letting you know how they feel inside as it is about seeking power. So you expect it, you don't react to it, you don't get hurt. Sometimes the experience of seeing that you don't get hurt and whatever attacks they do doesn't change your relationship and you remain open and receptive to them regardless can be the most important thing. That said, I think Melfi is right to pull him up on addressing her as Hun because it's a subtle way to express a very useful side of therapy. The therapist gets to play a new role in your life, someone very different from your usual cast of people. I suspect we'll talk about this more later down the line, so I'll just touch on it here. Um, in life, we can tend to have what is a bit like an unconscious cast of characters that we pressure other people into playing. At a very, very basic level with Tony, that can mean women who are either very powerful and domineering over him like his mother, or Women he can address as Hun. Women he can seduce, manipulate, objectify, try to seek power and control over. That is, putting it very simply, but we do that to them, they're doing that to us at the same time with their own cast of characters, and somewhere in between the two we form some sort of dynamic. Not to say we're all doomed to this cast we have whatsoever, it's not a fixed thing, it's not the be all and end all of human interaction, it's just a small point that can have an effect. Anyway, the point is if Tony expects Mel to basically be one of those things, a formidable dominating presence like his own mother that will make Tony feel weak and attacked, the way her question about depression made him feel, or someone he can seduce and kind of control in that sort of way he tries with most women in this show I guess. I believe there are actually several attempts to seduce even Melfi and a point in the show he believes he's in love with her. But as a counsellor, Melfi can be a third option beyond those roles. A chance for Tony to really experience on a close level a different kind of person to either of those two things, hopefully. Therapists have to work hard to become aware of the roles clients might be pushing them into taking up. They have to both speak to that, but also avoid falling into it, and that shows them, no, I'm a different kind of person, I don't behave in that sort of way. Not everyone has to fit that cast, you can learn new ways of relating to people. I am quite a strong and formidable woman, but I'm not here to make you feel weak and helpless either. Not all strength need make others feel weak. Um, in fact, I think true strength very rarely does. Anyway, the very small point I was trying to make before I got sidetracked is that by pulling him up on calling her Hun, she's kind of making that point. 
sort of. She's not falling into that set role. I'd personally offer them the chance to call me by my first name rather than Doctor. That sounds a bit too clinical for my liking, but then again, I'm not a Doctor anyway, so I probably wouldn't know. Sometimes it can also be good in this situation to ask why they're interested to know where you're from, or in a kind of playful, non-judgmental way, maybe just go, oh, that's an odd way of dressing me as a therapist, calling me Han. Where's that come from? What's that about, you know? I don't think that would quite be ideal here, but Tony responds... Avelino. My mother would have loved it if you and I got together. That same childish look of delight on his face, you know, I can flirt with you, Melfi. You're not in control, I am. But Melfi says nothing. She waits a moment, her original question still hanging in the air. She doesn't need to say anything, because when Tony doesn't get the reaction he wanted, he half sighs and looks away. Anxiety attacks are legitimate psychiatric emergencies. Suppose you were driving and you passed out. Which is true, it does need to be taken seriously, although I don't think Tony doesn't take it seriously. It's more, he doesn't like to think something is wrong with him. But perhaps he takes this comment from Melfi like some kind of scolding teacher or mother figure telling him off, because it prompts him to say what he's really been holding back. Nowadays, everybody's gotta go to shrinks and counselors and go on Sally, Jesse, Raphael and talk about their problems. Whatever happened to Gary Cooper? The strong, silent type. That was an American. AKA, that's how I want to be. That's the image I have for myself. You bringing up depression and anxiety attacks just reminds me that I'm not living up to this very idealized image I aspire to, and that makes me feel like a weak failure. That makes me feel personally attacked, so I'd rather not. See, see what they didn't know was once they got Gary Cooper in touch with his feelings, that they wouldn't be able to shut him up. And then it's dysfunction this, and dysfunction that, and dysfunction my fungal! The worry that talking about our feelings makes us inherently weaker. Which is actually something I touched on in my Ted Lasso video about masculinity, where more often than not, as you get better at processing your feelings, you instead become stronger and more in control. As actually kind of happens in a negative way with Tony in The Sopranos, in that he becomes more skilled and efficient at his job. If a client has reservations about the idea of therapy, it's very important they can actually voice them. The worst thing is when they hold those reservations in out of polite silence and none of it ever gets the chance to be addressed or thought about and they just have this slight annoyance bubbling away beneath the surface. I tend to refer to people receiving therapy as clients, not as patients, because I think the word patient carries connotations of being ill and that you were there to cure them, which isn't the right way to look at therapy. I don't think client is a perfect word, so I never actually address someone I counsel as a client to them, you know, but it's the best word to use for talking about it in these situations. Some therapists do use patients, such as Melfi, I just feel client holds slightly less negative connotations than the word patient does. You have strong feelings about this. Is a good response. It's not arguing back. It's not highlighting how Tony's wrong in her opinion. Right now, he just needs to know that you hear his feelings and that you accept them. I understand therapy as a concept, but in my world, it does not go down. Can I be happier? Yeah. Yeah. Who couldn't? Do you feel depressed? Once again, that's there like he's saying, don't go there but she persists. Do you feel depressed? Whilst he genuinely does have these strong negative feelings about therapy, it also partly serves as a defence, a way to lash out at Melfi for trying to force him to think about something uncomfortable. She accepted all of that, but she also didn't back down to it. Her job is to keep focus on the emotion. Reluctantly, Tony now admits. Since the ducks left. The ducks that preceded your losing consciousness. Let's talk about them. Tony storms out. And I think in many situations this would be the end of therapy for good. Tony would never come back, however he has another collapse which then sort of forces him to. Melfi's response there did sound a little too clinical for my personal liking. I don't like to use the let's talk about them sort of phrase, both because it sounds quite clinical but I also don't like the client to feel like I'm dictating all of the conversations. They need to have agency there too. I'd probably just have said what's so important about those ducks, what is it about them, that kind of thing, something more ordinary like that. I guess this is particularly why it's good to be more slow, more careful in the early sessions with a client, because too much they don't like and aren't ready for 
they might just never come back. To be honest, I'm not exactly sure why Tony storms out. I don't think there is a specific thing Melfi did wrong exactly. Tony was always on the edge about being there at all. Had she been a bit more gradual, a bit more inviting in the first session, given more space to explain things and talk about the therapy itself, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Maybe. She saw how worked up Tony was getting, maybe it was too soon to push him about depression. At the same time, you as the client have to think about very heavy feelings, there's no getting away from that. And as I also said, storming out is a very good way for Tony to show some of his agency, to have a slight rebellion. Having done that and established that, he may have decided to come back anyway, we don't know. These things can happen, it's not great, it's very frustrating, but it has happened. Unfortunately, he does collapse again and it forces him to come back, so let's get to session two with Tony now. So? You've come back for help. Don't look at that as a defeat. Is an important thing to say. I imagine in Tony's mind, Melfi feels very satisfied seeing him come back, like that classic, well look who's come crawling back sort of feeling. And it's important to let Tony know that's not how it is. It might be good to talk about what went wrong last time, what it was that upset him, what kind of happened about all of that, but she may have done that. This session starts in media rave. But she's part of that generation that grew up during the depression. But the depression of her was a trip to Six Flags. There's that D word again. Said in a slightly playful tone, I think it is very good and important for a counsellor to have a little bit of a playful tone at times. You don't want humour that deflects from the heaviness of the emotion, but very slight humour that doesn't deflect can be a way of affirming the idea that this is bearable. We can talk about feelings, they don't have to be too scary and impossible and painfully serious to cope with. Now that my father's dead, he's a saint. When he was alive, nothing. Hm. My dad was tough. He ran his own crew. A guy like that and my mother wore him down to a little nub. He was a squeaking little gerbil when he died. Right, I'm about to read too much into this, and I think this is reading too much into it, but it's also kind of interesting to raise regardless. There have been vague hints of Tony feeling emasculated scattered throughout this episode, perhaps most clearly when he comes to tell Melfi a dream about his penis falling off. In a more general sense, there are lots of stresses that feel out of his hands, how weak and unlike the strong, silent Gary Cooper this panic attack and his depression makes him feel the story here about his dad who is described like this Gary Cooper image, tough, strong, Tony's ideal that then gets worn down into nothing. Perhaps just the same way he sees his father's heyday of the business as having class and standards, whereas Tony came in too late and it's all wound down by now. In terms of his tough dad worn down into a little nub, we can wonder if Tony's talking about himself there as much as he is his dad, or if that Tony's worried a similar thing would happen to him one day. So yeah, in that sense he probably does feel a little emasculated. To me, being a man means being strong and tough not having to talk about feelings, therefore in being here I don't feel like a man. Perhaps even more so in that he is unsuccessful in flirting with Melfi. <laughs> the bits I was going to read too much into though is his use of the expression little nub when talking about his dad being worn down. Is that drawing on the image of a penis? <laughs> um, and the line that follows. I've got to be honest with you, um... I'm not getting any satisfaction from my work either. Knowing this is a fictional script, I do wonder if that was written in as an interesting point to emphasise the feeling. Vague, penis, sexual references to hint at emasculated feelings. It is tenuous, but it's kind of interesting to note, I guess. Of this story about Tony's mum, Melfi just responds... Quite a formidable maternal presence. Which is a good response. Often you don't need to be making big interpretations, especially less so early on. Just just feeding back the main takeaway or pulling out the key emotions of what the client has said is enough. It highlights you're really listening, it shows they are heard, and it clarifies the idea they're trying to get at. Tony explains he's not getting any satisfaction at work because of Rico. Is he your brother? No. 
the RICO statutes. Oh, of course, you know? right. You read the papers? Which is a clever way to add exposition about the RICO statutes and very in character as there's then something slightly patronising to Tony explaining it when Melfi has clearly understood. You read the papers? You know, the government's using electronic surveillance and various legal strategies to squeeze my business. This is a deeply troubling moment because there's absolutely no pretense this time round, no pretending you had coffee when you meant beating up a man. This is Tony openly saying, you know what I do for a living, I know you know, I'm going to talk directly about it, just not reveal any incriminating details. Which makes it much harder now for Melfi to turn a blind eye. It raises the question of what she's doing exactly. At what point does this go from correctly explaining the ethical ground rules to offering a technical loophole to get round them for the sake of work, to then becoming Dr. Melfi neglecting her ethical duty. At what point is she ignoring things she definitely shouldn't be? In that sense, if she is potentially foregoing her ethics for the sake of this client, what are her motivations to do so? Why do that? There are various arguments that can be made quite well, but what does she as a character feel is her motivation to do this? And I think she answers that with the trouble perhaps guilty look she shows here before asking do you have any qualms about how you actually make a living suddenly a personal motivation for her in this work not just her ethical duty as a therapist to help those who come to her not just the ordinary individual compassion and care you develop for your clients but a hope she personally has to somewhat reform him. As much as this show is a huge drama with all sorts of characters and action going on all over the place, you pull this show right back down to its essentials, and I think that's the main conflict. Can Tony be changed into a good person? Can I help him, or will I, in some way, get dragged into his world? And I think that adds drama to what would otherwise be just ordinary therapy scenes. It adds a layer of personal drama and conflict that a TV show needs. In terms of where the story is now, what's Tony's answer to her question? Yeah. I find I have to be the sad clown. Laughing on the outside. Crying on the inside. And Melfi nods because, as a person, that's what she was hoping to hear. He has to go along with a world of crime and pretend to be happy about something that eats away at his heart. That's what she hopes he means, except he doesn't. And her expression changes as she realizes. Used to be a guy got pinched, he took his prison job no matter what. Everybody upheld the code of silence. Nowadays, no values. Guys today have no room for the penal experience. So everybody turns government witness. I kind of find it funny to call it the penal experience, like it's just a natural part of the job, a qualification you need to advance further up the ladder. Um, Tony's qualms are with the culture and values of his colleagues nowadays, not with the immoral practices. If a personal hope is reforming Tony, then that's not the most optimistic hope at the moment. Melfi prescribes Prozac and the scene ends. Before the final session of this pilot episode, we get a brief scene in which Jennifer Melfi is waiting for a table at the restaurant Vesuvio when Tony walks in. She, of course, tries to hide, but he spots her and comes over to say hello. I suspect, knowing Tony, he's delighted to have discovered something a bit more concrete about her personal life, and to show a bit of small aggression to what I think is her husband, I can't remember, someone could comment. How you doing? Melfi is naturally very awkward in this situation. Her therapy approach is very on the side of not revealing too much to a client, and this obviously jeopardises that. A hundred percent more awkward than when you're a kid and you see one of your teachers out shopping. I think the issue in this case is that meeting here brings a whole new focus into therapy, which is Jennifer Melfi as a person beyond the therapist. In Tony seeing some of that, Already knowing his delight at discovering where Melfi's family originates from, there's the danger focus could partly shift away from his feelings to learning about Melfi, and she's got to avoid getting sucked into that. More so, it could put Tony off coming to his favourite restaurant, a place he may go to wind down, among other things. 
I don't think that's a concern in this specific case, though he might start to feel on edge about what he says and does in this restaurant, more wary of how he or his associates behave in case Melfi happens to pop in again and hear some of it. I think the bigger worry for him is the secret of therapy somehow getting out. You don't want Melfi in proximity with all his associates who would judge him for having therapy. Which hints I think at one of the great benefits for having a therapist you don't know with zero connection to your personal life. It makes things feel safe, contained. Like the therapy room is a place you enter, vents all your feelings and they don't leave that room. They never leak out into anything else unless you choose to do that yourself. Your therapist feels to you like someone who solely exists in that room rather than a person with a life outside of it. And so all the stuff you open up about feels more secure and contained in that space. Different trainings, associations, approaches may have different ideas about this, but ethically I was taught that if I were to be at a restaurant or pub or somewhere public and someone I counsel comes into that place, it's my duty to promptly leave, which I imagine would be very frustrating for whoever I'm out with. I imagine given the chance Melfi would have pressed the man she's with to just leave now and go to another restaurant, but Tony Watts is in, has a word with the waitress, and suddenly a table is made available. Mr. Borglund, they're setting up your table right now. She kind of has to stay and eat for a little bit, which is very much a power move on Tony's behalf. This is him saying to her, look how much power I can have over you. I can dictate if you get a table at a restaurant or not. Something he's no doubt delighted to be able to do. And again, that may complicate things a little when they go back into the sessions, but let's move on now. It's time to talk about the ducks. So I feel good. So I don't know if I'm gonna be needing to come back. Is one of those classic things clients may say from time to time and one of those things therapists tend to be a little skeptical about because it's very rare therapy just sorts everything out in several sessions. It does seem to have a dramatic effect here in terms of feelings. If we are to take it as true that he's thinking clearer, his wife thinks he's happier, that is of course very good, but is that a long-term sustained improvement? You don't want to finish therapy, then they suddenly have another dip and come back and this sort of stop-start feel to everything. That would not be ideal. And generally, endings to therapy are massively important and need to be done well, and that normally does take a little more time. It's pretty common that if a client is adamant on ending therapy, to kind of at least try and have one extra session to wrap things up and give it all a little bit of closure. All of this, I imagine, is part of what gives rise to the idea of therapists as people just wanting your money, who don't want you to finish so they can keep on earning off you kind of thing. I don't think that's true, I think that it's just an important process to endings. I can't deny there probably are some therapists who do think that way, but I've never met any. Getting to what is hopefully a positive and concluding ending, I find is 100% the most fulfilling part of the job. Tony thinks he's feeling better because of the Prozac. Melfi explains it's not that because he's not been taking it long enough for it to build up strong enough levels in the blood. Well, what is it then? Coming here, talking. Hope comes in many forms. Well, who's got time for that? It's a great response from Tony. I think we can all get exactly what he means. Even when I had counselling, I used to sometimes just feel like I don't have time in my day for this. I can't be bothered right now. I'm too busy. And that can be true, but it can also be as much about nervousness or feeling too tired to think deeply and do the work of therapy. And I guess to not have time for our own feelings is kind of a weird way to think about it. <laughs> um, I don't think I'd have suggested that to Tony, that going there and talking talking is why he feels better, because it might not be that. I'd have liked to have asked what he felt it might be first. There seems to be a bigger point here though, this scene did start in media ray, from some signal we may not have seen. Melfi has the feeling there's something Tony is intending to say. What is it you want to say to me? Awkward as he is, told with beautifully awkward body language and tone, Tony explains a dream he had last night. My belly button was a Phillips head screw and I'm working on screwing it. And when I get it unscrewed, my penis falls off. You know, I, I pick it up and I'm holding it and I'm running around looking for the guy who used to work on my Lincoln when I drove Lincoln so he can put it back on. And, you know, I'm holding it up and this bird swoops down and grabs it in its beak. 
and flies off. I once it. made a small video about dreams and I talked about how clients may come, explain their dream and be like, so what does this mean? Like there's this clear specific answer you can just give them back in return. Like therapists speak some sort of fluent dream language and can immediately translate any dream they're given into something understandable. I said in that video that the better thing to do is to explore the dream with them, ask questions about it, what emotions Tony had in the dream and after it what the narrative of the dream seemed to be, how any of it might relate to his real life feelings, are there any patterns that link to other stuff you've talked about in therapy before, just you know sort of explore it with them and see what their instincts naturally lead them in the direction of. The key thing with dreams is to 100% not tell them what it means, not just because you don't know but even if you think you did you might be wrong and you don't want to force them into the wrong conclusions. And even if you're not wrong, you might just be focusing on the less crucial side with the dream, the bit that their attention doesn't necessarily need to be drawn towards. What kind of bird? I don't know. Seagull or something. A water bird? Melfi thinks she has a link. They talked a lot about ducks. Tony has spent a lot of time with ducks. Them flying away marks both the points he started to feel depressed and had his first panic attack. If he's mentioning birds again, her feeling is that this might link to the ducks. She doesn't know for sure, she doesn't know what the dream means, but the idea of ducks feels like a link, so she leads Tony to try thinking about it. What else is a water bird? Pelican. Flamingo. What about ducks? As I say, it's important she raises this as a question, what about ducks, rather than a fact, this is about ducks. And it's based on how Tony reacts that she can tell if she's right or not. What about ducks? From his reaction here, it does seem like she's bang on. It's goddamn ducks. What is it about those ducks that meant so much to you? And we're right back to where we were before when he stormed out. The ducks that preceded your losing consciousness. Let's talk about them. This time he's more able to think about it. A few sessions have passed, if nothing else he'll be more comfortable in this space now. Not to mention I think she worded the question better this time round. Really you can just see he's in a more emotional, less defensive state of mind this time. Therefore Melfi is freer to ask these sort of questions. I don't know, it was just a trip having those wild creatures come into my pool and have their little babies. I was sad to see him go. Tony starts to cry and we see this nice side shot from a distance as she pushes the tissues across to I think indicate a slight moment of stepping back and taking a breather before Melfi brings in an interpretation. When the ducks gave birth to those babies, it became a family. Again, this might be wrong. This might not be the meaningful point. She doesn't put it out there as the answer, just as a thought to see what Tony's response is. It's a link, a connection. I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my family. I lost the duck. And this is a very good bit. You see Tony doing the heavy lifting here now. She highlights what she thought could be meaningful about the ducks and it enables Tony to take it a step further for himself. That's good counselling. I'm surprised they would have a moment like this so early on into the work that, you know, Tony would be reflective enough to be able to take in the interpretation and then actually take it further, but he does. Partly they needed to wrap up the episode effectively, but still, it's a great moment. Melfi in this first episode appears a very good therapist. That's what I'm full of dread about. It's always with me. What are you so afraid is going to happen? I don't know. I like the anger in his voice and expression here. It makes the transition into flames feel very fitting. We've talked about free therapy scenes in one video, this was quite a long video, but hopefully you've got something from it. If I'm going to offer something to take away, it would be this. Therapy is hard work, not every session, not all the time, but definitely in moments. It can be cathartic to go and vent your feelings, relieving, sometimes leave you invigorated, but other times it can feel a bit like someone ripping off a scab. Um, gentle and careful as a counsellor may try to be, it can still be uncomfortable and exhausting to sometimes have to think 
deeply about stuff you normally choose to never think about. The beauty of someone helping you to keep focus and delve further into the uncomfortable feelings is that the more you do think about them and talk about them, the less uncomfortable they begin to feel, the less all-powerful and scary and total control they have over you. And the therapist can safely guide you through that in a contained room that feels safe. One advantage then to Melfi's style is that it does keep it easier to stay focused when her as a person is taking up less space in the room. You still have to make a genuine connection to the client and I think she is doing that here but her approach keeps her very focused on Tony in a way Sean wasn't always entirely focused on Will. And for someone like Tony I actually think that probably suits him better even if it's what he wants less. Is one approach better than the other? Not exactly, no, there are good and bad reasons for both. The therapist has to work as suits them best, I tend to think. Anyway, I've been talking for a long time and my voice is starting to go. This is indeed the start of a new series. I don't entirely know how this is going to go, you know, if I'm going to attempt to analyse every single therapy scene from a very long show, or if I'll jump around a bit, pick and choose key ones. I don't know yet. I imagine as I do watch through the show more and both remember important stuff and become more familiar with the show and its characters that we'll be able to start drawing out more emotional depth about the characters themselves, but we'll have to see. For now, like the video if you did get something from it that helps, uh, subscribe even. Let me know what you think, what you can add, what I got wrong, let me know if you do want me to continue this series, support me on Patreon if you want to offer some extra support to help keep this channel going, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Janice McMahon, Luke Hall, Chichu Kaber, Michael Gallagher, In Squares, Dustin Paulson, Brian Herring, Samara Salsi, Sharikov 2814, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramwell, and Incomplete Sentience. Thank you.